What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows, and I am here to give you continuous coverage of the G1 Climax 32. This one is going to be night two. It is currently July 17th, 2022. If you don't know, July 16th, July 17th, the two opening days, Saturday and Sunday, both of them were free on njpwworld.com. You did not need a subscription to go and watch the opening nights of the G1 Climax. However, if you did decide to get a NJPW subscription, that is awesome. It's only $7 a month, but if you didn't, that's cool too. Speaking of subscriptions, if you enjoy this review or any review or any other podcast episode where I break down professional wrestling like no other, consider getting yourself a paid membership to marieshadows.substack.com. That online sale that I have going on is 28% off for the whole entire year, including monthly as well. So instead of paying $750 a month, you're paying five and change a month. Instead of paying the $60 a year, you're paying like $43 a year. And that helps the brand, that helps me keep going and letting me know that you guys are enjoying the wrestling content that I'm putting out there into the world. Everything that I do is original. Everything that I do is on a daily basis of the newsletter. And it goes directly to your inbox to let you know that I dropped something new wrestling related. You can easily get yourself a paid subscription to marieshadows.substack.com by going to that website, that URL, but also doing a forward slash and typing in G132, and that takes you to the membership page if you want to get a paid subscription to help out the newsletter, the content, and everything else. When you go paid, with marieshadows.substack.com, you'll be able to unlock all the goodies. So the full G1 reviews, you get to unlock. You get to unlock wrestler interviews, such as my interview that I did with United Empire and New Japan Pro Wrestling's own Aaron Hanare. And then on July 19th, And then on July 19th, live on twitch.tv forward slash Marie underscore shadows, I will be interviewing New Japan Pro Wrestling's LA Dojo's own Clark Connors. If you are not able to make it to the Twitch event, it will be on the newsletter, marieshadows.substack.com. But again, I will only give you guys a preview. Those who are paid are able to watch the whole entire interview. So just keep that in mind. I like to give you guys options for what you do with your hard earned money and any type of contributions financially wise. It's up to you guys. No pressure, but it is encouraged. So I could continue to do the awesomeness that I do in my wrestling content. Now, before we jump into the review of the G1 Climax 32, I want to remind everybody that For free subscribers to marieshadows.substack.com, you guys will only be listening to Ishii vs. Taichi from Block B and Jonah vs. Yano from Block A. If any free subscribers want to listen to Kenta vs. Zack Zaber Jr. in C Block and the main event, which is Shingo vs. Juice, which is D Block, you will have to upgrade to a paid subscription. Apologies in advance if you think that's unfair, but this is a lot of work to cover, especially for one person doing all the coverage of the G1 and to make sure that everyone in my community gets it sort of on time and gets it daily, including any type of thumbnails, scorecards, goodies that pertain to the G1 that I have to make from scratch. That takes time and effort. So again, free listeners are only going to get two matches. Pay subscribers are going to get the full thing. Summary write-ups are included in both. But if you want the full experience, like I say on my Twitch channel, 
you can always upgrade so it does not interrupt your experience as a professional wrestling fan or just a general supporter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start off the G1 Climax 32 review. Let me tell you about our opening match for Block B. Taichi and Ishii have bad blood. What kind of bad blood you're asking? Ishii does not like the way that Taichi has decided to make his career in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Taichi doesn't care about what Ishii says or thinks about how someone should go about in their career in professional wrestling. Taichi got to the opportunities and the spots that he got because he was alongside underneath the shadows and behind and toe certain people that got him into the positions that he basically is in. Ishii feels like Taichi was always cutting corners, that nothing he ever did was genuine and hard work. Ishii, on the other hand, did everything in his power in the hard work kind of way to get his name up there, to get the positions that he has, and definitely show the Japanese crowd why he is the best and everything that he has done for the business. Now, sometimes us as fans can think about the rights and the wrongs about how you come up in the business. I think that working hard is one of them. Cutting corners is not always the best, but I always go with the idea of work smarter, not harder, but that's not a safety net for everything when it comes to professional wrestling. There are just certain things that you can't get around to sort of cheat off of. There's things that you have to go through the hardships in professional wrestling in order to be the best. And if you go through those hardships, you do come out a better wrestler. You do come out a better storyteller. Just hope that the injuries don't pile on because injuries can happen regardless of what you do in this business. And then there's also a lot of risk involved too. So Ishii and Taichi always has this very repellent personality where Taichi will always say some snide, snarky remarks. And Ishii doesn't really stand for that. Ishii is more the respected kind. Like you can't really, I don't know if he has a sense of humor. But Ishii is one of those like old school wrestling heads where it's like we have to go with tradition and we can't really stray too much from it. So that is the bad blood because during the G1 press conference, of course, you know, Taichi is going to say some stuff. So here in this match, in this opening match of Ishii versus Taichi, to me, it was okay. It wasn't the best. Ishii usually has some really good matches depending on who it is. Taichi as well. This one was a back and forth strikes, basically like 90%. 90% of it was strikes and kicks. We start off very traditional with a collar and elbow tie-up. Both men are equally strong when it comes to the collar and elbow tie-up, so no one really budged. However, Taichi manages to slap the shit out of Ishii with an open palm and that dazed Ishii as if like it was super powerful. Usually strikes like that when it comes to slapping Ishii around happens close to the middle getting towards the end of the match. Not in the beginning part of the match. That's where I kind of thought that that's where I kind of thought this match was probably not going to last very long. And then I was starting to think back to Ishii being out at Forbidden Door because of his knee and Clark Connors took over. And so, you know, it was just a weird thing to see that an open palm strike took Ishii down and totally had him dazed and confused as if like his soul was about to leave his body. 
Tai Chi doesn't slap that hard. Tai Chi doesn't kick that hard. Tai Chi is known for his kicks, but he's not a really powerful striker at certain times. He's good in the ring. I enjoy his in-ring ability, but he's not that heavy-handed as other guys are in the business. And Ishii knows this. Ishii has taken on monsters. But yet then this open palm slap takes him down in the beginning of the match. I know I'm focusing on it a little too much, but that really bothered me. So Taichi goes in, starts stomping Ishii. The referee does check on Ishii. Ishii is okay. He continues the match. It felt like this was very personal. When you get the chance to watch it, it's definitely a personal match with the way that they kick each other, strike each other, and everything like that. It was always like countering. Sometimes one of the guys would get a lariat in. Ishii would get his Kamiguri in. And then Taichi would do the last ride. Yes, the Undertaker move the last ride on Ishii, stack him up for the pin, but Ishii kicks out of that. Taichi goes in for a Saido suplex after countering Ishii. Ishii kicks out at another pin attempt. Ishii does a drop kick during this match. That is rare. Ishii does not really do drop kicks. Ishii is beating the shit out of you the same way that Murder Grandpa will beat the shit out of you with strikes, kicks, a lot of throws to test your might and your mettle. Taichi goes in for a dangerous backdrop. That is what the simple backdrop is called because he is in a tag team with Zack Zaber Jr. and they are called the Dangerous Techers. With that happening, the dangerous backdrop, he does a bridge pin, but Ishii kicks out. Taichi manages to get a sumo throw in on Ishii. He tried earlier, but Ishii wasn't budging. And Ishii just ate that sumo throw, got right back up into having a tackle to Taichi. But Taichi absorbed that. And here we come with a kick. And sometime a little bit later... Ishii is able to get that sliding lariat to Taichi and goes for a pin attempt, but Taichi kicks out. They then come to a close by Taichi doing Black Mephesto, which is his finisher, to Ishii, and that allows Taichi to go over, get the pin, one, two, three, and win two points in the second night of the G1 Climax 32. Our second match for the G1 Climax 32 Night 2 comes to us from A Block. We have Jonah representing TMDK taking on Yano, who's representing Chaos. And I'm really going to start this off by saying, fuck Yano, fuck this match. Yano got a bullshit two points to put him on the board for a block. Yes, I am sorry that I spoiled it for you guys, but that is really some bullshit. Yano being in this tournament always manages to get some type of victory when you least expect it. Fans who do not watch New Japan Pro Wrestling on the regular will not expect it because they don't know what to expect from Yano. But someone like me that has been covering New Japan Pro Wrestling for a while, I know what to expect from Yano. I still think that Yano does not deserve to be in this G1 climax at all. We all know that he's not going to win the G1. We all know he's not going to get the title shot. We all know he's not going to face Jay White for that IWGP World Heavyweight Championship title. Yano's main thing is to hover around the King of Pro Wrestling trophy. And that was made in the summer. And that was made by Okada. And so the King of Pro Wrestling trophy was born because Okada wanted something more for the guys to fight over. So why not make that And it has been a staple to Yano forever until Yano lost it. Yano was the longest holder of that King of Pro Wrestling trophy. Then it went to Chase Owens. Then it went back to Yano. Then it went to Murder Grandpa Suzuki. And then it went to Yano again. 
went to Tai Chi, went to Shingo, and then I have no idea who has it right now. I may or may not be right or wrong about one of those guys or how like it went back to one person or another. But that's the holders of the Kingdom Pro Wrestling trophy. Now, I'm only giving you this background so you can understand a little bit more about Yano and what he does in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Everyone does think that Yano is just a comedy wrestler. Yes, he is a comedy wrestler, but he's also a scary motherfucker, too. If you guys ever want to go back to one of the Wrestle Kingdoms, he created a reverse battle royale where you have to have guys coming out after a certain amount of time. You fight the guys. The only catch is you have to handcuff the guys to the handcuffs that were around the ring and around the guardrail. And that means that they were out of this reverse battle royale for the Kingdom Pro Wrestling trophy. It was basically like New Japan Pro Wrestling. Tell me you're kinky without telling me you're kinky. All right, let's get back to the match at hand. So Yano tries to create a friendship with Jonah because Yano is completely scared of Jonah and Big Bad Tito. This does not work. Even if Yano is like, let's be friends. Here is the shirt I want to be friends with with you. Giving it to him like a peace offering. Doesn't work. Yano then tries to do a roll up on Jonah to get a quick pin. Jonah kicks out of that. Yano has an amateur wrestling background, which he used in college, and he tries using it on Jonah. For those of you that don't know who Jonah is, Jonah used to be in WWE as Bronson Reed in NXT, and he won the North American Championship title. He is from Australia, and he's a big boy. He has a lot of muscle. He's round, if that helps with description, but he's a very big boy, very powerful boy, and... Yano tries to do an amateur wrestling move on Jonah with no momentum. So this is why it doesn't work. Jonah just does a shoulder tackle to Yano and find wrestlers tape on Yano and gives it to the referee. So there goes Yano's second choice to maybe cheat in this match. Yano then gets up and hits Jonah in the back of the head and nobody likes to be hit in the back of the head. So Jonah goes after him. And throws him into the guardrail and then take him inside the ring and does a side bear hug to Yano. Yano manages to get a rope break. And then Yano's favorite thing is to remove the corner pad. He does. He sends Jonah in it and then tries to roll him up. Jonah kicks out. When Yano is seated on the mat, Jonah comes in with a rolling tackle. Goes for a cover. Yano kicks out. Yano then manages to do a belly-to-belly suplex using that amateur background of his on Jonah. But the only way that happened is because of the momentum from bouncing off of the ropes. That's the only way it can happen. Then we get a senton and a pin, and Yano kicks out. This is from Jonah after that belly-to-belly suplex. We get some fighting on the outside, And then this is where the bullshit fucking happens. As they're fighting on the outside, Big Bad Tito decides to also get involved. Yano sidesteps and pushes Big Bad Tito into Jonah and decides to do a double low blow. Now, in professional wrestling, for those of you that are learning about professional wrestling through me and listening to these podcast episodes... If you do a low blow, it's basically a DQ in wrestling. But in New Japan and certain other companies, referees are sort of lenient. And they're very lenient when it comes to Yano, especially in New Japan. So Yano decides to do a double low blow to both Big Bad Tito and Jonah. And while all this is happening, the referee inside the ring is counting up to 20. So wrestlers have to get back into the ring to break the count before the count of 20. Yano rushes to the ring. Jonah is almost there, but he collapses at 19 and 20 during the count. 
And then Yano wins via count out. And that gives him two points. A bullshit win. Our third match for the G1 Climax 32 Night 2 is C Block Kenta versus Zack Zaber Jr. You know, Kenta doesn't like a lot of people. And Kenta being a C Block is definitely the wild card in that whole block. It's not anyone else, it's Kenta. Kenta can be your friend while still backstabbing you if need be to further get ahead of you. Kenta has always been sly and slick in his career. He's definitely one of the best to have a wrestling career, and I enjoy his wrestling career. In this match in particular, he obviously didn't like Zack Zaber Jr. Zack Zaber Jr. tends to run his mouth a lot and just says a lot of random shit that I'm like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And for some reason, Zack Zaber Jr. is always ending up the one that crawls out of his matches when he wins rather than like walking off his victories like other wrestlers. It's the weirdest thing. He takes the most damage, but he really does play the long game with his opponents in order to really take them off their game and finally capture them in something they weren't expecting. It is true that Zack Zaber Jr. is a technical wizard. I will give him that. But other than that, his personality, it's like, bro, just change up a little bit. You don't have to be cocky. Not everyone is against you. Like, lighten up. So in this one, Kenta wanted to embarrass and also put some humility in Zack Zaber Jr. Because Zack Zaber Jr. tends to talk a lot of shit. Right in the beginning of this match, they were having a banter contest because Kenta feels like Zack Zaber Jr. should be calling him senpai. That Kenta believes that Zack Zaber Jr. is beneath him, so he should be calling him senpai. That is a person that he looks up to. But Zack Zaber Jr. is not going to have that. Zack Zaber Jr. was yelling out about vegan chanko which is their specialty made in the dojos. Even the sumo wrestlers eat a version of chanko in order for them to get big. It's to help you gain weight. You can add any type of vegetables you want. It's basically a soup. You can even add protein. I do know that probably most of them have protein in it. So, you know, you get all those flavors and it's like naturally seasoned. So that's what chanko is. And that's what the young boys... And the young lions always make for their superiors, their senpais, any one of them that is higher in the ranking. So aside from the banter, we automatically start out with kicks where Zack Zaber Jr. finally catches one of Kenta's kicks and twists Kenta's ankle. Kenta manages to get to the ropes to cause a rope break. And it's just a back and forth of who can kick who, who can counter who we do get kenta throwing zach zaber jr into the guardrail on the outside and does a ddt on the floor to zach zaber jr as soon as they get back into the ring zach zaber jr uses the ropes to his advantage and puts on a leg submission on kenta it does take a little bit for the referee to tell zach zaber jr to let go of the submission in the ropes So what does Zack Zaber Jr. do after that? Well, he takes Kenta to the outside and tangles up his leg into the barricade to cause more pain to his already damaged leg. Then in the ring, Zack Zaber Jr. puts Kenta in the bow and arrow, which looked amazing. Zack Zaber Jr. has been working on Kenta's leg for half of the match. And then we come to a point in the match where we have a kick exchange where Kenta is like, hey, I could kick you harder than you could kick me, and that's what happens. However, that doesn't last too long as Zack Zaber Jr. manages to stomp away onto Kenta's tricep. Kenta has a history of a lot of injuries, and most of the wrestlers know where to target on his body for those repaired injuries, the triceps being that one. 
Kenta manages to pull out a power slam, but doesn't have enough to cover Zack Zaber Jr. However, he does get some offense back in when he does an STF to Zack Zaber Jr., but Zack Zaber Jr. manages to get to the ropes. And then Zack Zaber Jr. puts Kenta in this guillotine shoulder hold combination and then flips him over into a crucifix pin. Kenta kicks out of that. Then we get a powerful exchange of strikes, a drop kick to Kenta's arm by Zack Zaber Jr. And Kenta does the green killer, which is a hanging pendulum drop to Zack Zaber Jr. While Zack Zaber Jr. is in the corner, we have a running Kenta doing a soaring drop kick and then goes up to the top rope to do a double stomp onto Zack Zaber Jr. Kenta goes for the cover. Zack Zaber Jr. kicks out. Zack Zaber Jr. continues to work on Kenta's ankle. And then as Kenta gets out of that, Zack Zaber Jr. runs into a knee by Kenta. We get a second side knee attack, or what I would think was a shiny wizard, to Zack Zaber Jr. Kenta goes for the cover. Zack Zaber Jr. kicks out. Kenta then does the same move again. However, when he goes for the pin, when the referee counts two, Kenta picks up Zack Zaber Jr. to break the pin. This is Kenta's way of trying to embarrass wrestlers that he feels does not give him the respect that he's owed. And so this happens for a couple more times where Kenta does something to Zack Zaber Jr., goes for the pin, picks him up at the counter two just to get that embarrassment and try to injure him further. But this really does backfire on Kenta. Kenta should have been smarter. Kenta is a really smart wrestler. Sometimes that chip on his shoulder that he has gets the best of him. And so Zack Zaber Jr. is completely calm in this situation. He's not freaking out. He's not trying to get away from Kenta to create some space. He's continuing to put on submissions on Kenta by grabbing his leg. And Kenta doesn't realize the trap that Zack Zaber Jr. is making so he can capture Kenta. And guess what? He does. Zack Zaber Jr. has Kenta in this multiple hold submission where he's holding on to his legs. He got at least one of them trapped. He brought over that arm that has the messed up tricep that has been surgically repaired. And as he pulls that arm, Kenta automatically taps out. And that allows Zack Zaber Jr. to pick up his first two points for C block via tap out. Kenta knows better. Kenta should have just taken the victory via pin rather than trying to embarrass Zack Zaber Jr. But sometimes egos get in the way. Again, our winner for C block. For night two of the G1 Climax 32 is Zack Zaber Jr. picking up two points. And now we come to the main event of the G1 Climax 32, night two for July 17th, 2022. Representing D-Block, Shingo versus Rock Hard Juice Robinson. Juice did not wait for Shingo to take off his entrance gear. Before deciding to jump him, I believe that Juice Robinson is the wild card in D-Block. Juice Robinson does stop attacking Shingo to tell the referee to ring the bell and have this match officially start. The referee does just that. On the outside, they begin fighting where Shingo is thrown into the barricade. And then Shingo collides with Juice, dropping Juice straight to the floor. And then picking up Juice to drop him face first onto the apron. Shingo comes in with a knee and tackles Juice Robinson, drops some elbow drops onto Juice. And before Shingo can do the last of his combination inside the ring, Juice decides to roll out. Shingo follows and tries to attempt a Death Valley driver on the apron. This is where Juice slides away and gets out of Shingo's grip only to pull Shingo down by his feet 
so Shingo can hit his face, face first on the ring apron. And then Juice follows it up with sending Shingo chest first onto the barricade. Now, keep in mind that New Japan Pro Wrestling's barricades do not have any type of cushion or support. It is all steel. After that, he throws Shingo into the ring post and then places Shingo on the barricade in front of the color commentators, Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton, and does a lariat to Shingo. Getting back into the ring, we have Juice doing a lot of punches and chops to Shingo. Now both of them are in this full exchange of who could chop harder, who could punch harder, until Juice does a back body drop into a senton combination, goes for the cover on Shingo, but Shingo kicks out. Juice Robinson then slows down the pace and does a rear chin lock to Shingo. Shingo manages to get out of it, and Juice does a flurry of offense. However, Shingo manages to capture Juice in a Saido suplex. Shingo comes in with punches of his own, fakes out one of his combinations where Juice automatically goes to protect himself, and that's when Shingo hits him with the DDT. We get a Brain Buster snap suplex because Juice decided to shift his weight while Shingo was going for a Brain Buster. Shingo covers Juice. But Juice kicks out. As Juice sits up from kicking out of the pin attempt, this is where Shingo would normally do his sliding lariat move. However, Juice has enough awareness to roll outside the ring. Now, this is interesting. Juice knows to roll outside the ring so that way he doesn't get caught in Shingo's offense. Who else in Bullet Club, in the history of New Japan Pro Wrestling, does that? The catalyst of professional wrestling, our IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, Jay White. Jay White is known for always getting out of the way for certain moves that other wrestlers do. Juice is definitely studying Jay White. Juice is definitely learning from Jay White, even if he probably already had this idea to do this. It is definitely effective. So, because Juice rode away to avoid shingle sliding lariat, out comes a shotgun drop kick to Shingo by Juice Robinson. And to pick up speed to do his famous cannonball, Juice Robinson goes for the pin attempt on Shingo. Shingo kicks out. Then both men climb up to the top rope, Shingo meeting Juice, and Shingo doing a superplex to Juice. Both men are down for a bit of time until we get a full Nelson bomb on Shingo by Juice. And Shingo kicks out of that too. Juice then decides to go for the eyes of Shingo and then do a gut buster to Shingo. But that's not enough. Shingo turns it around and does a gory special to Juice and then follows it up with a deadlift wheelbarrow German suplex before finishing off with a sliding lariat to Juice. Shingo manages to capture Juice's spear that he tries to do between the ropes sometime later to where Shingo does his own style and version of Goto's GTR, which is just hanging them on the ropes and doing a elbow drop to bring them down. So like a pendulum elbow drop on the ropes though. We get a pumping bomber. Shingo goes for the cover. Juice kicks out of that. Juice tries his finisher, which is the left hand of God, which is just a left jab. And then he goes for, I believe it's Pope Friction in a way. I might be pronouncing it wrong. And so Juice goes for that cover as well. But Shingo kicks out. Shingo is resilient in these matches. We get a exchange of powerful lariats, powerful shots, powerful punches until we get some more punches and then we end it off with Pope Friction. And that allows Juice to go over for the cover, get the one, two, three, and manages to pick up his first two points 
for D block. Overall, I think that opening night one, July 16th, for the start of the G1 Climax 32 was a lot better than opening night night two of the G1 Climax 32. It was very fun to watch each and every match. They all had their different stories involved in each of the matches, and I hope you guys enjoyed me reviewing the matches whether that is free or paid. So to update everyone, the current standings for night two of the G1 Climax 32 are as follows. Representing B Block, Taichi has two points on the board. Representing A Block, Yano, has two points on the board. Representing C block, Zach Sabre Jr. has two points on the board. Representing D block, Juice Robinson has two points on the board. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed that, make sure to give this a like, share, tell a friend, let them know that they can definitely subscribe to marieshadows.substack.com and get paid subscriptions and all of that to keep everything going. Thank you for supporting the newsletter, the podcast, the video cast, the Twitch, the newsletters, everything that I do to create wonderful wrestling content. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on this journey with me. I can't do this without you. So again, make sure to tell a friend, let them know that I do wrestling content. And just a quick reminder, Monday, July 18th, we will be live on twitch.tv forward slash Marie underscore shadows to generally talk about the G1. You guys can ask me questions. You guys can be there in the chat and we'll all have a good time. July 19th, 2022 i will be interviewing clark connors so again don't miss those two if you do not want to miss them and you want to get the notifications sign up at lu.ma forward slash g132 for all g1 discussions or and lu.ma forward slash ccnjpw for clark connors when come July 19th. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to a brand new episode of the Square Circle Podcast, where we cover the G1 Climax 32. I'm your host, Marie Shadows, and I'll see you guys on the next one.